So a little bit about us. I'm Baraj Prek. I'm Field CTO at Astronomer, and I'm one of the co-founders of the company. Pete DeJoy. I'm also one of the co-founders with Baraj. I run product for Astronomer. So. It wouldn't be a far cry to say that we've been doing this for a little too long. We started the company way back in Cincinnati. I think we were both like at least like eight years younger at this point. It feels like 30 years younger. Yeah, now. right? A lot less stress, a lot happier. And nowadays, we're based in New York. If any of you are based in New York and want to chat data engineering or Airflow or even just need like a place to work for a day, our office in New York is great. And, uh, you know, we love hosting visitors. So let's kind of rewind the clock about a year. Pete and I gave a talk last year about how folks in the community would actually build Airflow services. We actually use the same intro slides for these as well. Yeah, I, th I think like one of the great joys that Baraj and I have had in the last almost 10 years of building a company around Airflow is we've really had a front row seat to seeing like what people do with Airflow, especially in kind of extreme enterprise scenarios. Many, many of our customers are running Airflow in some of the biggest deployments in the world and for some very, very extreme and important use cases. And along with having a front row seat to seeing what our customers in the community do with Airflow has come like a change in our own perspective of what people do with Airflow. Like we often joke when we started Astronomer, we were doing like a lot of kind of analytics consulting work in some ways, like before we even had a product. It was a lot of traditional dashboarding, traditional kind of uh, just ETL for, for data analysis. One of the big shifts that we're kind of, we've kind of observed really in the last two or three years from our own customer base in the Airflow community is this shift from analytics to operational workloads in Airflow. And this is obviously corroborated by, by the Airflow survey where we see many more folks running ETL or ELT that's relevant to business operations and uh, a lot more ML ops as well, things that are, that, are, that are much more traditionally operational and critical path to building, I'd say, critical outcomes for these co companies. We also have a bunch of like kind of anecdotal evidence in our customer base that I, that I won't get into here. But generally speaking, a lot more regulatory reporting, a lot more embedded data applications, a lot more machine learning than we saw uh, five or six years ago. A lot of this is correlated with what we describe internally at Astronomer as the rise of the data product. Just maybe a quick show of hands, who uses the term data product to describe what they work on? Great, that's good news. If, if I didn't see any hands, then it would have been a, a, tough, a tough rest of the presentation. <laughs> tough to follow that up. Um, yeah, we, we really, I, I did, the notion of a data product, or like I'd say like the absolute entity is not all that new of a thing. Like people have been da building data products for many, many years. But we are hearing this term be much more commonplace inside of data teams in the enterprise as folks think about how to contextualize what they do, right? Like, again, going back to kind of how things have changed for Viraj and I, when we started doing Airflow, we, we talked a lot about Airflow primitives, DAGs, tasks, operators. Now we actually hear customers talking much more in the context of these data products and thinking about the actual outcomes they're driving with those DAGs, tasks, operators. A bunch of different examples here. Uh, Data-powered applications, we see a lot of our customers really embedding tables from analytical databases in their user-facing or revenue-generating applications. We actually have a lot of customers doing regulatory reporting and kind of business-critical operational processes with Airflow. Uh, a lot of very traditional analytics and reporting use cases. A lot more MLOs for kind of personalization and recommendation. But also in the last year, we've seen the rise of this new kind of LLM ops gen AI use case. And obviously, this is something that, that folks ran pretty hard towards. And we'll talk about this in a little bit more depth today. And I, I hope folks have had the chance to see some of the other Gen AI talks that have happened, because I know there have been a bunch today. But it's been, it, it it's been kind of interesting, because when, when we first started having these discussions with customers, it kind of felt like, like people were kind of given these very complex, heterogeneous data ecosystems. And data teams and data engineers were asked to like reach into these ecosystems and magically pull out AI and figure out how to make this happen because everybody needs to do AI. And that was like obviously very impractical effort for starters because the actual implementation of, of Gen AI wasn't necessarily attached to a feature or outcome. And there was this real mad dash towards actually using AI as a strategic differentiator for your business. At last year's keynote, we, we attempted to, to really take a first pass at what Gen AI and kind of doing kind of a retrieval augmented generation application with Airflow looked like. Julian actually gave the keynote last year on our Ask Astro product, which is kind of chatbot that is trained on a bunch of different Airflow data sources that we have internally. And we've obviously seen a lot more media around Gen AI pop up since. And you know, this is, this is corroborated by all of these really incredible foundational model improvements that have come in the last 12 months. But it still does feel like it's, it's quite noisy 
and that there are a lot of opinions out there. And a lot of folks are kind of, now I think, reverting to some mean where they're simultaneously acknowledging that, that generative AI and, and foundational models are really revolutionary technology that pose a very significant shift for the technology industry. But also, there's still a lot to be determined about the applications of these in the enterprise. Now, the good news for us and for the Airflow community is that it seems that the Airflow community is actually in a really, really strong position to embrace this revolutionary technology and be at the core of building next generation applications around language models. Databricks published this uh, top 10 data and AI products study, or uh, white paper, what was it, Viraj, in Ju June? July, right around DAI. Yeah, we were at the summit. And Airflow is front and center, right? One of the most commonly used products alongside uh, kind of that, their, their processing layer for building AI applications. Also, you see that there are plenty of, there's no shortage of Gen AI talks about at the Airflow Summit this year, a very hot topic of conversation. And there are many providers as well that have built, been built by the community over the last year on, on you know, interfacing with vector databases and model APIs and, and everything that goes into actually building Gen AI applications. Yeah. So I think on this talk, we just wanted to dip into that a little further and talk a little bit about what the community is doing around this. And maybe there's some reference architectures or use cases here that would be inspirational for something that you would want to build at your company. So from what we've seen, there's really four general use cases that Airflow is driving as far as Gen AI goes. There's RAG or retrieval augmented generation, you know, your classic chatbot. There's frequent fine tuning. People want to fine tune their models every week, every day, et cetera, like another batch process. There's batch offline inference. And last but not least, there's resource management, really around managing the resources that you need to train your models or fine tune your models and so on and so forth. All of this kind of needs three things, right? You need dependable data delivery. You need reproducible, scalable workloads that can be checked into version control. And you need to be able to do evaluation and experimentation quickly. Airflow kind of gives you all of this right out of the box. You know, there's all these people at the Airflow Summit here because Airflow is great at these things. But double click a little bit more into that, right? Those four use cases we see power six general business products. Support automation, product discovery, product insights, churn analysis, summarization, and image generation. Quick show of hands, how many of you are running some sort of use case like this inside of your company? All right, so we got a pretty decent, pretty decent number there. That's awesome. And then one, of the, one of the really exciting things I think about all of these is, you know, we, again, we have the great privilege of talking to a ton of Airflow users and customers about what they're trying to get out of their data platform. And the commonalities, I think, in these applications has been very interesting to see across different industries and different verticals. It's like a lot of people are trying to solve very similar problems. Yeah, I think every insurance company I've talked to has some RAG app that's doing summarization and classification in, uh, in production, uh, which is a nice little vertical use case. So here's a couple of things that we learned along the way in terms of doing things ourselves, talking to customers, and engaging with the community. Number one, things move very fast. You know, it's a rapidly changing technology with, you know, a new thing be released being released every week. Number two is you really do need lineage and governance. I think these are pretty loaded terms. So in the scope of this, it's really just knowing where your training data came from. And last but not least, balancing cost and quality. You know, I was talking to one of our customers who's, uh, they're leading an ML team. And I asked them, like, hey, what has your ML team been doing? And his response was, they've been pumping NVIDIA stock price. You know, it's very hard to make sure that you are making sure that the dollars it takes to use Gen AI is actually producing the quality and outcomes that you want. So let's talk about how fast things are moving. You know, it started off with ChatGPT, and then it was Llama 3, and then it was Claude, and then, I don't know if you've guys seen uh, what OpenAI put out today, but like as of like four hours ago, it's like ChatGPT 01 or whatever. Absolutely magic. I, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty mind blown by it. Uh, so things are just moving really fast here. Lightspeed Partners put out this report that talks about how people have productionized Gen AI. And on average, if you have Gen AI in production, you're using over two different model vendors. Uh, I thought this was really interesting because people aren't just taking one and going with it. You know, same way people have multiple clouds, multiple different databases, the same things are happening with your foundational models. So last year, we debuted Ask Astro, which was a chatbot that we have in our customer channels, we have in Airflow Slack, and a couple of other places. It started off as this. You know, Julian designed this architecture. Um, it was pretty simple. We're just stealing his I'm just, I'm, 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 We're just stealing his slides. Exactly, right. Giving his whole spiel. <laughs> One of the benefits of working at astronomers, you can steal Julian's slides. It makes your life a lot easier. <laughs> but it was pretty simple. 
it had a couple of internal sources. It used Langchain for, for processing, and then used OpenAI as the uh, model around uh, for embeddings. When we look at what we're doing with Ask Astro now, a year later, it's a lot more complex. Um, directionally, here's how we're taking this. We have a lot more different sources we want to pull in. We're doing some things on our own compute, some things on different GPUs, and doing a lot of things around making sure accuracy is happening the right way. So let's kind of talk about this in the context of Ask Astro, right? The first thing we have to do, um, the first major change, I should say, is we swapped out our foundational model. OpenAI is great, but we found that Cohere's embeddings model work a little better for us. The second thing we wanted to do was around quality. As more people started using Ask Astro, we wanted to make sure that we were really prioritizing questions about our own product suite rather than open source Airflow because we rolled it out to customer channels, which actually made the stakes a lot higher. We had to, incre we had to respond to the fact that customers were using this when they had support issues, community members were using this as part of the first interaction with Astronomer, there's more traffic, and so on and so forth. The reason why we were able to do this well is because Airflow was the foundational piece that we picked. You know, we were able to quickly integrate additional sources and deliver that data reliably. Everything was in source control, so we were able to treat it like a real production application. And we ran a ton of experiments to evaluate what actually helps serve our business needs through this. I think, Raj, one of the, one of the really interesting things about this is I, I think one of the reasons why Airflow has become so really so popular over the last decade is its ability to embrace kind of the heterogeneity of these data platforms and optionality. I remember like in, in the early days hearing folks talk about loving Airflow because it makes it very easy to integrate with anything that you want to integrate with. And it's almost like in this kind of whole Gen AI movement where now the pace of innovation is actually even faster than it ever has been. That's those things point. that have always been true about Airflow and the reason that the community has always loved Airflow, actually like those strengths are almost accentuated, right? Because it, makes, it gives you that, a lot of optionality to plug and play with different technologies as they come out of the, come out of the ecosystem. Exactly. Let's talk about lineage and governance a little bit. <clears throat> so like I said, lineage and governance are a pretty loaded term, and they can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. It's just in the scope of your Gen AI use cases. What we found that you need is two big things. Number one is tracing back dependencies between teams. Oftentimes, before you kick off fine-tuning a model, or in some cases, training a foundational model, you want to make sure you can track where the data came from, both for regulatory reasons, for quality reasons, and so on and so forth. At a lot of companies, that first piece of ingestion is often handled by a different team. So lineage in the scope of this really just means knowing where data used for training runs came from. Additionally, you want to be able to trace those dependencies as well. What you don't need in the scope of this, probably need it in your organization, but not to production at NAI, is this idea of end-to-end -end lineage. Uh, that can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. It goes into the BI layer and is just probably too big in scope. And what we found is you can't always rely on the lineage a specific system will give you. Um, there's just too many sources to interact with. So our friends at Cohere gave a talk about this at an Airflow, in an Airflow meetup a few months ago. Their solution to this was they actually built a custom library called CoLineage, and they kind of had two general uh, strategies. CoLineage let them define inlets and outlets for folks doing things within Airflow to collect that lineage, the most important things. And they also had a bunch of Airflow DAGs that went through and collected metadata and lineage about their training data before they used it into model training. This was really important to them because it was part of the regulatory requirements they needed to hit to um, productionize some of their models. Right? The user data they had from Europe had to be treated a little different than the user data they had from the US. Oftentimes, if you can build your own lineage solution you know, that um, fits you like a glove, that's awesome. Not everyone has the engineering resources to do that. Um, so one thing I always like to point out is that Airflow has a lineage solution built in. Open Lineage is built into Airflow in 2.7 and beyond. It's supported by all three major clouds, as well as most major data catalogs. And it gives you all the information you need around tracking where your data, your data came from for your training runs by default. Airflow is actually broadcasting this information every time it runs a task. How many people here have you ever heard of or are using Open Lineage? Awesome, yeah, most people. Same people that said they're using Gen AI almost. <laughs> yeah, I think the final, the final kind of theme that's been emerging is just trying to find and strike the perfect balance between cost and quality. Now, naturally, it's very easy to land on the conclusion that you can throw a ton of money at any problem and it will kind of produce an optimal result. 
But it really is a balancing act as you think about how frequently you should be fine tuning your models and how many resources you should be throwing at them. Obviously, very easy to not spend much money and have inaccurate, inaccurate models. And it's, it's, it's actually just very hard to have a strategy that's both cost effective and highly accurate. We've, we've seen a lot of folks really put out content here from the community around what really has proven to be the right balance. At the end of the day, like the, the common theme in a lot of these presentations that, that folks have given around really finding this medium and this middle ground is about leveraging Airflow's configurability and extensibility such that you can actually really figure out what that right frequency is and really what that, what that right balance between cost and quality is. Uh, again, this is going back to, I think, the, the core theme of the presentation. It's like these foundational things about airflow. It's configurability, it's optionality, it's, it's control, really shine very nicely in these modern gen AI use cases. Now, these aren't things about airflow that have fundamentally changed. They've always been true and always been a reason why the community has really embraced airflow and continued to grow it at a striking pace. But um, these things also make airflow very well equipped to handle a lot of these modern requirements. And in full transparency, this is actually a topic that we know the least about, but there's two really good talks, both today, that uh, talk about how some of our customers and community members have figured this out. So the ASAP one was actually a little earlier today, so the timing didn't work out with uh, pubbing that. But Laurel's talk is actually in the room right next door in a little bit, and I would really encourage everybody to go see it because they do some pretty inc incredible things to make sure that they're keeping cost in line with how they use their LLMs. We also have a podcast recording with Laurel, as well as a Medium article that ASAP uh, talks about how they use uh, what, how they use Airflow for their Gen AI um, strategies. And last but not least, like you know, we put out a lot of content at Astronomer, and putting out content is great. But even better than that is like getting feedback about it and learning from the community about it. Um, so there's three things that if you guys are thinking about productionizing Gen AI on your own, that I would love to point you towards. We have a cookbook of different reference architectures. That support automation use case I showed is actually part of that. We have some reference architectures in our documentation. And last but not least, uh, Mark Lamberti actually taught an intro to Gen AI course with Apache Airflow in our academy, free for folks to use. So if you're thinking about getting started, we would love for you to test these out and let us know what you think. That's all we got. <laughs>